um, besides JC and Kindle, who else has taken like a parapsychology in undergrad? Okay. So this might be just a review and um, I'm sure basic biology. I just kind of did at the very beginning what um, some just basic terms and then we just kind of go into some of the diseases. I mean, there's a bajillion amoebas, and, um, but I picked the ones I thought were you know, interesting, important, um, that you may see just because where we live. Okay, lecture objectives, mine are very generic as usual, but basically I want you guys to know the disease, the, how does someone get it, how does one present, um, how do you diagnose it, and how do you treat it. So again, this is just some definitions of what a protozoa is. Protozoan parasites exist worldwide. Um, they occur among people in rural, underdeveloped, or overcrowded places. Not to say we don't have them here in the U.S., but that's where the majority of them occur. Um, they can emerge as a serious threat um, to a single individual or <coughs> an outbreak um, to a population. Uh, parasites can affect humans in several ways. We've already talked um, about some of these vector-borne will be your um, tick-borne illness and all those, and you'll have that, well, it's actually any vector. It could be deer, animals, dogs, humans. Um, ingestion, so they eat raw, undercooked foods, um, foods that are uh, contaminated with feces, eggs, that kind of stuff. Um, inhalation by the spores, which you guys kind of got that on Tuesday with the um, fungal lecture. And penetration of the skin, penetration of the eyes, we'll talk about a couple of those today. And then sexual contact with the STDs, which I didn't cover again this module because you guys had it pretty good in OB-9. Um, so protozoans are single celled organisms that multiply by simple binary division, so mitosis. Um, they multiply in their human host and can cause overwhelming infection. Now some can multiply and cause no infection or no harm in the um, human host. Um, they enter the, the ones that enter the body via ingestion of you know, raw cooked foods or um, contaminated foods have two morphologic forms. Um, we kind of talked about this when we did the lecture. I probably should have done this beginning before I did the malaria lecture, but um, trophozoites, uh, they, this is where they feed and reproduce stage that lives within the host. Then they cause come in forms of what's called a cyst and these are the infective form that survives in the environment. So these ones are very hardy, um, and they can live in the environment for a long time under certain temperatures and things like that. Um, but they can, these cysts, when they go enter the human host or the vector, whomever it is, then they can turn into trophozoites, so then they become um, infective. And then they also, sometimes the trophozoites can undergo uh, encystment, become cysts, before they leave the body in um, feces. So the parasites are usually presented by, or categorized by their movement. So you have the ciliates, you have the amoebas, the flagellates, and the apocomplexins. And those, the ones in the last category, would be like our malaria, the plasmodium um, group. So that's that one. Ciliates, there's only one, I didn't cover it, um, that can cause a disease in humans. I just kind of cut that out. And then uh, today we'll talk about a couple of amoebas and flagella. So what is an amoeba? So this is a type of protozoa that has no truly defined shape. So if you see them, they look like just big giant blobs is what they kind of look like. Um, they move and acquire food through things that are called pseudopods. And they're found in water sources throughout the world, usually in warm um, waters. And few cause disease. So there's a bajillion of them, but then you have some that are hardcore disease makers. <clears throat> Those are the few that we'll talk today. So there's the blob on the side, the amoeba. The <coughs> three types that we'll talk about today, the first one is Entamoeba histologica, histologica, I'm sorry, and this one can cause um, uh, amoebic dysentery, so a lot of diarrhea, stomach pains, that kind of stuff. And then um, the next one is the one that causes meningoencephalitis, um, it's neglaria, and it um, These are the ones that are common in, it can occur in everybody, but the majority of them are contact lens wearers. So anybody who wears contact lenses in here? I do. My no. sister does. And what I can't stand is the people that, do you ever put your contact lenses in your mouth? 
and then take it back out and stick it in your eye. I've seen people who do that, and I'm like, oh, God, I can't get it. You have dirty your mouth, and you're sticking that in your mouth and then in your eye. So, and then my sister, it drives me crazy. She likes to touch her contacts or rub her eyes, and she doesn't want to and she gets makeup and all kinds of stuff on her. And then she ends up with that eye. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the first disease is amoebiasis, and it's a disease caused by the Entamoeba histolytica, <coughs> and anyone can have this disease. Um, it's more common in people who live in tropical areas um, with poor sanitary conditions. So, again, they thrive in that warm, murky waters. Um, in the United States, um, and mediasis is most common in people who have traveled to tropical places, so usually people have gone somewhere and come back. Um, <clears throat> they have poor, they've gone to an endemic area with poor sanitary conditions. Um, also immigrants from tropical, tropical countries that have poor uh, sanitary conditions, or people who live in institutions that have poor sanitary conditions. So in other countries, those who live in, well, not all of the orphanages, but some of the orphanages, really poor rural areas, um, they live in, you know, hut houses, there's a lot of stagnant water, that kind of stuff around them. Um, and then they put in here men who have sex with men. That was just part of what was on there. I was like, oh. So how does one get an infection from E. histolytica? So usually it's basically they can put anything in their mouth that's touched the feces of a person who is infected with E. histolytica. I just figured out why it's men faces. Sorry. Um, <laughs> and they swallow something such as water or food um, that is contaminated. And again, swallows a cyst picked up from contaminated surfaces or fingers. So it's a lot of times things that are, you know, that's why some bugs can live dormant and lay on like your table, your fork, your spoon, um, and then you touch that and you put your hand to your mouth. So I get onto my kids all the time. We go out in public. They like to touch everything, and then they immediately like to stick it in their mouth. That's why kids are young, they're always sick, because there's bacteria everywhere, and your kids will touch it, stick it in their mouth, rub their noses, they're always sick, um, especially in daycares. So in daycares, it's you know really crowded. Your kids, um, you know, the parents who should not send their kids sometimes still send their kids. I will say I sent my kids with snotty noses to school, but... Um, so imagine they're not very sanitary with their nose blowing and wash, hand washing, and so uh, they get toys and stuff on it, stuff on their toys, and then they share the wealth. So um, three types of amoebiasis can result from infection. So the first one is a luminal, and this is a least severe form that is, uh, and usually these people are asymptomatic, and then you can have what's called invasive um, amoebic dysentery. This is the more common form of the infection. Um, these people have bloody mucus containing stools and they will have um, cramps and abdominal pain. So if you're thinking of someone who might present this way, what other diseases did you guys learn in GI that this could be a differential for? Ulcerative colitis? Ulcerative colitis, yes. I mean, you can have, sometimes people can have bloody stools, you know, or it's really not mucusy, but, um, which is a virenteritis, you know, um, maybe sometimes somebody with diverticulitis, or even just, um, what's the other one, not ulcerative colitis, but um, what's the other one? Crohn's. Crohn's. <coughs> Um, and then you have invasive extra-intestinal um, I mean, oh, I spelled BBI, this is so wrong, sorry, I couldn't be there. Um, trophozoites carry via the bloodstream throughout the body, so basically that's um, systemic or a, a disease. So this is a nice little graph on how the amoeba, um, due to E. histolytica, can go into the body. So they pass through the stomach as cysts, so they go into the stomach through the large intestine, and, and then they emerge in the terminal small intestine down there, and they can form deep ulcers, and so that's when you have those ulcers in the stomach and colon, that's where you get the bloody mucus from, 
Um, and then they could perforate the large intestine leads to infection of the peritoneal cavity. So a lot of times with people who have ulcerative colitis, they sometimes get secondary infection from um, the ulcers and they're put on metronidazole or some type of um, antibiotic. And then some of the amoebas from the cysts pass out through the body and the cysts remain alive in the environment and are transmitted through food and waste. <coughs> Some amoebas pass into the bloodstream and infect other organs. That's the um, extra intestinal ones. This little graph shows you the nice little cyst and when it turns into a trophozyte is when it starts invading and causing ulcers into the body. <coughs> so signs and symptoms. So 10 to 20 percent of the people uh, who become infected don't really get sick. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, sorry, become sick. Onset is usually two to four weeks. Uh, the symptoms are quite mild and can include loose stools, stomach pain, stomach cramping, so just like a regular gastroenteritis. Um, the, like I said earlier, the amoebic dysentery is a severe form, and those people have the bloody stools, um, stomach pain, and fever. And like I said, <coughs> spread. What they do in the liver is they can usually cause abscesses. It can also go to the lung and the brain. But when I was reading this up, most of them go, if they do anything, it's forming in the liver. They form pus pockets and things like that into the liver. So how do you diagnose this? So basically, you would do a stool sample. Um, just like most of the GI stool samples. You guys talked about stool samples in GI, right? <coughs> so a lot of times, you may not get an egg or a bacteria in one stool sample. So. Most of the times, we'll get instructions to do multiple stool samples different times of the day. Um, that way, that hopefully, they can catch something in one of those stool samples. Um, and then if you have an extra intestinal uh, infection, you can do imaging, look at the liver, um, do a CT or ultrasound, and, and or you could try a trial of an amoebicide. Um, so like I said earlier, these can be difficult to diagnose because they look like a similar, just a regular old GI bug or some other type of um, GI disease like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So there is a blood test that's available, um, but it's only recommended if you have extra intestinal diseases like in the liver, then, um, but it may not be helpful because this one doesn't give you guys like the IgM, IgG. So could have been infected in the past, but it doesn't differentiate. Um, and I think, did Professor Reggio talk to you guys about IgM, IgG, or you guys had that way back when too, right? Okay. Um, what's acute infection, IgG or IgM? M. 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 Okay. And um, how do you treat this? So initially you can try them on metronidazole and or Tenodazole. I've never heard of that. I've only known metronidazole. Um, and then there's a couple other drugs you can use to help eradicate the cysts. So the first two drugs don't really eradicate, it mainly eradicates the parasite or the trophozoite, but not the cyst formation. Um, prevention, so basically avoid uncooked foods if you travel to any areas that are endemic uncooked foods, even the salads and the vegetables or any potentially contaminated water. Um, so like when I went to Vietnam, I didn't eat anything that wasn't boiled or cooked or that was <coughs> cooked by my family members because a lot of times they will um, boil it and clean it, you know, it's cleaned well. Um, I never drank water or even soda cans. If, if I did, it would have to be a can that was unopened, you know, can't be from a <coughs> soda bottle. And I always drank from a straw and it had to be a brand new straw, not like a straw that they just stuck in there for you. Um, Boil water, obviously, that can kill the bacteria. You can use a chemical disinfectant. You can use, like, I know sometimes you can soak them in um, vinegar and things like that to help kill the bacteria. And what's that one stuff that they've used? They've marketed it um, to clean your vegetables and stuff with, you know, like here in the U.S.? The iodine drops. Huh? No, it's like a wash that you put into your, um, with tap water or something. We used it in this. Mexico, but I don't. I can't remember Just the like name of it. I don't know that it's commonly used anymore, but I remember like in there, I don't know, 10 years ago they had something like that. Um, and then you can do portable water filters, but I don't even know if I would trust some of those portable water filters. 
So I would just mainly do um, bottled waters. All right, so the second type is acanth amoebas. So there's several different species of this. Um, these are free-living amoebas. They can cause infections in humans and in animals. Um, these are found in lakes, swimming pools, uh, tap water, um, and, in any, and in heating and air conditioning. <coughs> um, these infections usually occur through cuts or scrapes. And this is the one that we're talking about that can cause um, disease in the eye um, through the conjunctiva or through inhalation. <coughs> so the one we're talking about is the amoeba keratitis and encephalitis. Uh, Acanth amoeba keratitis is basically conjunctival inoculation. They kind of go through little small cuts into your conjunctiva. Um, and then also for people who wear contact lenses, so they either use tap water, you know, like if you're out, and I think I may have been guilty of doing this one time. I'm sure I was out of town and ran out of contact lens solution and you put your contact lens in tap water. Um, you don't know if it's clean tap water or not, or you sometimes even can get it um, in your eye. Um, so amoebic encephalitis is the more common out of the two, which is, I think is kind of interesting. So again, the acanth uh, amoeba can uh, exist in two forms, the trophozoite and the cyst. It's kind of basically went over the same thing, the trophozoite trophophage through mitosis. Um, under less verbal circumstances, they become cysts for survival. And they enter the body, ulcerate the broken skin, um, and then they can invade the CNS through blood dissemination. There's a nice little graph. So this one through the eye, and then this is through the passage of the lower respiratory tract and through ulcerated or broken skin. So acanth amoeba keratitis. So it's a rare disease. It can affect anyone, but like we said earlier, it's mainly those who wear contact lenses. Um, in the U.S., 85% of the cases occurs in contact lens wearers. Um, for those who wear contact lenses, you know, they've talked about what you can do to, that they do that increases the risk of getting this disease. Um, so storing and handling the lenses improperly, um, defect, disinfecting lenses improperly, like we talked about using tap water, uh, swimming with your contact lenses in, using it in a hot tub, or showering while wearing lenses, what kind of infection do you think you could get if you wear it in a hot tub and you get water in your eye? Um, or coming into contact with contaminated water or having a history of trauma uh, to the cornea because that basically leaves a little open opening for the bacteria to crawl up in there. So signs and symptoms. So what's hard about this is it can kind of present itself like someone who has a conjunctivitis. Um, they will have unilateral foreign body sensation, they'll have tearing of the eye, maybe some photophobia, uh, decreased visual acuity, um, tearing, pain, and redness. <coughs> so it kind of can sound like a regular old eye infection. Um, usually, like I said, it's unilateral, but it can affect both eyes. Um, what you're looking for is pain out of proportion to the clinical findings is a classic feature of acanth amoeba um, keratitis. However, especially early in the disease, you can sometimes have lack of pain. So normally these people can show up and not have a lot of pain, but as the disease progresses, um, they'll have more acute, severe pain. So there's just a couple pictures. So signs and symptoms, they can have congenital hyperemia, episcleritis, scleritis, um, and loosening of the corneal epithelium. Can you imagine waking up and your eyes look body like that? I would die. <laughs> so the diagnosis, the first step is to have a high degree of suspicion, especially someone who um, wears contact lenses. So if your patient calls and says, hey, I've had an eye infection, um, can I come in and see you today? And they come in, they kind of have that hazy, glossy look to their eye, and they, you start talking to them, get a history, they do wear contact lenses, so that's why it's important when you talk to your patient about anything with eye disorders, you have to wear glasses or contacts. Um, so if they say yes, then you start to, you know, asking them, where have you been, what have you done, you know, what do you use to put your contact lenses in, 
Um, have you traveled anywhere? Those are kind of things you might want to ask them to help you get a higher suspicion of rather than a, just a normal old conjunctivitis. Um, so you can do, <coughs> you can diagnose with clinical picture and isolation of organisms from the colonial, corneal culture or histopathology. So a lot of times, you, know, you may treat your patient, you may think they just have a run-of-the-mill conjunctivitis, and that's fine. If they come back, they're still having issues, they're worse, their pain is worse, then I would ship them off to an ophthalmologist or an optometrist who really can look at, get a really good look at their eye. Um, confocal microscopy is just this fancy microscope that they put it under rather than the you know, regular immunofluorescence. Um, and you can do the PCR assays as well. Treatment. Um, so current treatment regimens include a topical uh, antiseptic such as polyhexa, methylene, biguanide, or uh, chlorhexidine, um, with or without a dilator. So that procanamide is a, I don't know if you guys ever had your eyes dilated. When you go in, that's the drop that they put in to help open up your pupil, but it also acts as a good anti-inflammatory as well. Um, the duration is pretty long, so usually six months to a year. Um, and the pain control can be given, uh, can be helped by topical cyclopegic solutions um, or NSAIDs. I'm sorry, the cyclopegic <coughs> solution is the, the one that opens the eyes, I'm sorry. The propanamine um, and or hexamidine are antibiotic drops. And so how do you prevent getting this? So basically, good sanitary hygiene, wash your hands before you cut, put your contact lenses in uh, or even before you take them out, especially if you wear ones that you can restore and use you know, every day. Now, if you have ones that you throw out at the end of the night, you might be okay if you just want to just stick that in there. But again, you should wash your hands before you put anything in your eye. Um, wear and replace contact lenses according to the schedule. I will be guilt. I am guilty of that. Whenever I had contact lenses that were, you know, one month that you could take in and out every night, I would extend them to two months. Just because it was so expensive to get them every month. But you should use them as properly prescribed. Um, and then wash your hands with soap and water. Clean the contact lenses according to instructions. <clears throat> and then um, store the lenses in the proper storage case. So. Making sure you use contact lens solution and not tap water in your case. So let me see if this works. I was going to be trying to be nifty and put a video in here for you guys. Yeah. It doesn't work. It worked yesterday. You might know how to play a video from the slideshow. Try hitting escape on the keyboard. Or not. Yeah, I get this try escape. Nathan can't preview on his. It did? Yeah, so I just like double tapped it and preview on the screen. I know, so how can I want to do it on? Oh, that's not the one. Oh, I don't realize that one. I'm going to figure out how to get to show. Okay, let me go search for it. 
Nick Curry is While he was on tour in Greece, his life was devastated by a parasite. When I got back, I was in Paris actually, and I woke up one morning with a just a slightly red eye. And I... While he was on tour in Greece, his life was devastated by a parasite. When I got back, I was in Paris actually, and I woke up one morning with a his life was devastating. Enter swimming pools. While he was on tour in Greece, <laughs> his life was over and over. What's this? When I got back, I was in Paris actually, and I woke up one morning with a just a slightly red eye and a conjunctivitis. Suddenly, things took a turn to the worse, and I woke up one morning. The eye was kind of frosted over, and I could no longer see through it. At that point, I realized that this was not a laughing matter. When Nick visited the LA hospital for tests, they discovered that his eye had been invaded by microscopic parasites. Nick had worn contact lenses for years and was always careful how he looked after them. I'd been educated by ophthalmologists that you never store your lens in water from a tap, but I was told it was all right to wash the lens container in tap water, and so I did that. And was always careful how he looked after them. I'd been educated by ophthalmologists that you never store your lens in water from a tap. But I was told it was all right to wash the lens container in tap water, and so I did that. Nick's predators could account for maybe are found in tap water, swimming pools, even in bottled water. They had entered Nick's eye through an insignificant scratch on the surface. Not, I don't think there's any realistic prospect at all of any useful sight returning in the eye. Most patients, I have to say, Nick Curry, stage name Monus, is an international musician. While he was on tour in Greece, his life was devastated by a parasite. When I got back, I was in Paris actually, and I woke up one morning with a just a slightly red eye and a conjunctivitis. Suddenly, things took a turn for the worse, and I woke up one morning, the eye was kind of frosted over, and I could no longer see through it. At that point, I realized that this was not a laughing matter. When Nick visited the LA hospital for tests, they discovered that his eye had been invaded by microscopic parasites. 
Nick had worn contact lenses for years and was always careful how he looked after them. I'd been educated by ophthalmologists that you never store your lens in water from a tap. But I was told it was all right to wash the lens container in tap water, and so I did that. Nick's predators could account for me being are found in tap water, swimming pools, even in bottled water. They had entered Nick's eye through an insignificant scratch on the surface and made it their home. They live there, they make a little city and they reproduce and they swim <coughs> on the surface of your eye. Nick endured months of treatment to try and get rid of the acanthamoebae, but his eyesight continued to deteriorate. I mean, I could try and look at a, a source of light and I would just see vaguely, I certainly couldn't see my hand, I mean, I'd see <coughs> just a, a very strong light, possibly the movement of a strong light. This moist, warm environment was perfect for these invaders. As they multiplied, they set about destroying his cornea. I need hardly say that this is a very, very regrettable outcome of the whole infection. And you had so many hospital visits, very considerable. At his next visit to the consultant, the news was worse than Nick had feared. It has really done terrible, terrible damage uh, to the right eye. There's no long-term prospect that I might see again. I think not. I don't think there's any realistic prospect at all of any useful sight returning in the eye. Most patients, I have to say, enjoy better outcomes, better results of treatment. Uh, you know, really, in your case, it really could hardly have been worse, and I'm not quite understand and realize that. I knew that there were dangers associated with wearing lenses, but nobody had ever warned me that uh, you could get bugs in your eye which would destroy the whole surface of your cornea. And that's scary. I still don't know quite how these little creatures actually do so much damage. Springs. 
Um, it produces an acute and usually lethal CNS disease called primary amoebic meningeal encephalitis, or PAM. Um, it infects people who are, when water containing amoeba enters the body through the nose. Um, the amoeba travels up the nose to the brain where it destroys brain tissue. It's also called the brain-eating um, bacteria, brain-eating amoeba. Um, you cannot be infected, which I thought was interesting, by drinking contaminated water. It actually has to travel up the nurse through the nose. Um, rarely infections occur in contaminated, um, inadequately contaminated, or chlorinated swimming pool. So if you have a swimming pool that's not adequately chlorinated, sometimes you can get this disease there, but it's rare. Um, or if you have tap water, that's also infected that enters the nose. Um, it's not shown to spread through the vapor or droplets. I got close at the bottom on the square. <laughs> I didn't realize you can't see it very well up there. So again, this life cycle, they have the morphology are cysts, trophozoids, and flagella. They, uh, the only infective stage is the trophozoids in this, with this bacteria. They infect humans, again, like I said, penetrating the nasal tissue and migrating to the brain via the olfactory nerves. So it's a nice little graft here. So the <coughs> water, you have a cyst, um, and it becomes a trophozoite, then they can become a flagella the jelly form, which helps them travel up um, through here and into the nose. Signs and symptoms. <clears throat> they usually occur about five days after infection. Um, usually you can just have headache, fever, nausea, vomiting, so differentials could be just a migraine or a common headache. Um, so then later you have symptoms of neck stiffness, confusion, lack of attention, uh, like a balance seizures and hallucinations. So what differential would you have in this one? Meningitis? Meningitis, yes. Um, so the disease progresses rapidly and usually causes death within about five days. Um, the fatality rate is over 97%. Only four people out of the 143 known infected um, in, the, in North America have survived. <coughs> Um, there have been seven cases in Oklahoma since 1998. Um, oh, like four people. So two of them, one was in Mexico, and I think two were in California, and one may have been in Arizona. I can't remember for sure. Um, none that I found in Oklahoma actually survived this. Um, all I know is don't go to Lake Murray, because <laughs> two of them were at Lake Murray, and, and um, you know, down near Ardmore. Do you remember that? I think this one was either last year or in 2015. <coughs> was a younger lady who had two small children. She'd gone out to Lake Murray. Do y'all remember that? And she kind of got sick, and then she ended up dying. And there was a gentleman the year before, that same year, he also went to Lake Murray. Got this brain eating bacteria, amoeba, and he ended up dying. So don't go to Lake Murray. Or if you go to Lake Murray, plug your nose <laughs> if you jump into the water on your nose. Um, so how do you diagnose this? Um, you can take a sample from the CSF, biopsies, um, so with the tissue specimens you can do immunofluorescence, PCR, a culture for the amoeba. Um, due to rarity of the infection it's difficult to initially detect this disease um, but about 75% of them are post-mortem, post-mortem, post post-mortem, um, which is kind of horrible. Because think about it, there's so many things that could be when the person presents. So again, it's getting a good thorough history of where you've been, what were you doing, those kind of things to help you um, really hone in on what it might could be. <coughs> um, treatment for this, if they survive, so I looked at the... Um, different treatment regimens. So the two that survived in California were younger, I believe it was an eight-year-old and a 12-year-old. Um, and then there was a 16-year-old, I think, that was in Mexico, I can't remember. Um, but this is the combination of uh, drugs that they use that seem to work for them. However, they've tried it in other people and it didn't work for them. So basically, you can give amphosoterin B, um, either a ketoconazole, fluconazole, um, myconazole and or rifampin, um, and then dexamethasone to help with uh, brain swelling. Um, so recently there's an, inve an investigational breast cancer 
um, and anti leishmania it's a, another amoeba type or parasitic uh, disease drug that has shown some promise in combination with um, some of the drugs that we used before. <clears throat> often have deadly consequences. The amoeba hijacks the brain for a benign reason. To find food and shelter. Inside the brain, the amoeba has a perfect environment to feed and reproduce. You have food, heat, moisture. It's perfect for them to live their lives. But by living their lives, these parasites endanger ours. The amoeba has a two-pronged attack. First, it hijacks the host cells using special feet called pseudopods. Then, the amoeba cuts a hole in the cell wall. And when the contents of the cell leak out, the amoeba eats them. Not only are the amoeba ruthless killers, they also have a cunning method of evading the body's immune system. The amoeba can defend itself by forming a coat, which is called a cyst. And this coat surrounds the amoeba and is impervious to the host's immune system. When the body's white blood cells attack, the amoeba forms its protective coat. The white blood cells latch onto the coat, but can't get through. Then the amoeba sheds the coat and escapes unharmed, leaving the white blood cells behind. 98% of those infected with the Nigleria falari parasite die in less than a week making it one of the deadliest parasites on the planet. Nagleria fowleri lives in bodies of warm fresh water such as lakes and rivers in tropical and subtropical regions. The parasite can infect humans if contaminated water enters the victim's nose. There, the amoeba latches onto nerve cells in the nose and travels into the brain causing a condition that is almost always fatal. Nagleria fowleri is a single-celled organism that typically lives in warm fresh water. It thrives in tropical and subtropical regions. Infection occurs when contaminated water enters the victim's nose. There, the amoeba latches onto nerve cells and makes its way into the brain. Nagleria fowleri infections have been reported in 18 U.S. states. The majority of cases have occurred in Texas and Florida. To minimize the risk of becoming infected with the Nagleria fowleri parasite, the CDC recommends that people swimming in bodies of warm, fresh water avoid getting water up their noses. The CDC also recommends not stirring up sediment 
while participating in water-related activities. In the United States, of individuals infected with the Nigleria fowleri parasite have survived. In most cases, the Nigleria fowleri parasite kills its host in less than a week. Nigleria fowleri is most common in lakes and rivers of the southern states, but it's been found as far north as Minnesota and as far west as California. Cases of human infection with Nigleria fowleri are actually very rare. Since 2004, only 34 cases have been reported in the United States, and the majority of those cases occurred in Texas and Florida. To minimize the risk of infection, the CDC advises people swimming in bodies of warm, fresh... about our flagellates. These are protozoa that possess at least one flagellum. Um, the number and arrangement of flagella is important to determine the species. species. Um, the flagellates include members of the genre Trypanosoma, um, Leishmania, Giardia, and Trichomonas. <coughs> you guys had a Giardia lecture last time, right, in GI? Did Okay. Well, I have an infectious diarrhea lecture um, next week. Sally is going to do that, or Professor Work, and then um, I'll make sure she includes that in there. I thought you guys had it last time. Trichomonas, you know, obviously from the STD lecture. Um, today we're going to talk about the trichomonasoma and the leishmania. I think I might have left that one off. Um, so, T. cruzi. Um, this causes something known as Chagas disease. Have you all ever heard of that? So I never really heard of Chagas disease until I was working at this campus. Um, I guess a group of students had gone to, God, they were on, I don't know where they went, but they came back and there was somebody that was um, diagnosed with Chagas. So then all the other people had to come get tested that were on the same trip. Um, so it's endemic in Central and South America. There are approximately 8 million people in Mexico, Central America, and South America that have Chagas disease. Most of whom do not know that they have it or are infected. Um, sometimes, if untreated, infection is lifelong and can be life-threatening, um, just because it develops other systemic issues. Um, transmission occurs through bites by tri um, triatomine bugs. Um, after they bite and ingest the blood, they defecate on the person. Um, these are also known as kissing bugs. Um, so what they do is these bugs like to come out at night while you're asleep, they crawl up onto your face, and they bite your face, usually around your lips or any types where the, there's mucosa. Um, that's why they call them the kissing bugs. So after they bite and feed on you, they poop on you. So after they poop on you and you're kind of wake up because you've been bitten by something, you swat the bug or do something, and you basically push that poop into the open wound or sore, and that's how you get infected. <coughs> Nice tea cruisy bug. Um, so you can also have it transmitted by congenital, so basically from a pregnant woman to her baby, blood transfusions, organ transplantation, consumption of uncooked foods contaminated with feces from the infected bugs, and accidental lab exposure. Um, I'm assuming why these are more common this way too is because, like I said, a lot of people walk around in South America and not know it, and um, they can pass it without knowing that they're doing so. These are nice, another little graph from the CDC. Um, I put these graphs in here because it kind of helps me and understand. I'm a more of a graph person as far as pathophysiology, so it might help you all to look through that. So, Chagas. It occurs in three stages. So, in acute, um, when it occurs in endemic areas, usually in childhood. So, when you have an acute infection, usually when they're young, and they're usually asymptomatic. But um, in real time, you can have an acute infection, and it occurs one to two weeks after exposure. Um, you can have an indurated erythematous lesion called a shigoma. Um, it appears at the site of the parasite entry. You can have what's called Romana, Roma, Romana sign, because um, it inoculates the conjunctiva. You have unilateral, periocular, palpebral edema um, with conjunctivitis and preauricular lymphadenopathy. 
So basically, they invite you somewhere close, you rub it, the feces into your eye, and you wake up like that. So you can have latent disease. Um, <coughs> these people have parasitologic and uh, serologic evidence of the T. cruzi, but have neither symptoms or abnormal physical findings, um, nor do they have cardiac or GI involvement. So these are people that are basically carriers, so they've unknown that they have it, um, but they may develop later on when it becomes chronic and develop some of the GI and cardiac issues. Um, many are identified by screening enzymolate um, immunosorbent blood assays, which is also called the ELISA. Um, did Dr. Professor Reggio talk about the ELISA yesterday? Kind of. Okay. And you probably will get this again in the HIV lecture, because um, this is what we also use for that. Um, and you can also confirm it with what's called a RIPA, which I've never heard of. This is the radio immuno um, precipitation assay when they donate blood. So a lot of times these people don't, unbeknownst to themselves, if they carry it, they are tested, and then you also have to have a confirmatory, so you get tested twice. Um, chronic disease, it develops in 20 to 40 percent after a latent phase um, that may last years to decades. Because sometimes those people who are latent phase, they check, get their blood checked by donation or whatever, and they found out to have the disease and they're treated. Some, you know, not ever find it they have it, can develop into a chronic phase. Um, when they hit the chronic stages, they can develop cardiac and uh, GI issues. So how do you diagnose this? You can do um, <coughs> light microscopy of a blood smear, so peripheral blood smear, or um, tissue biopsy. If they have something on their skin, like a cutaneous tissue biopsy, that. Um, again, screening would be uh, serological testing, confirmed by a second test, either an IFA, EIA, or ELISA, which is your initially, and then followed by the RIPA that we talked about. They have PCR-based tests, um, but once they're diagnosed, if you diagnose with somebody with this, you should get a screen, EKG, and chest x-ray. Um, and if they have any cardiac or abnormalities, you should order an echo. And obviously, if they have um, intestinal symptoms, you should get um, either a GI imaging or an endoscopy, or you could do like a um, barium swallow, something like that. Treatment of the disease, um, antiparasitic treatment is indicated for all cases of acute or reactivated Chagas disease, um, or someone who has chronic T. cruzi infection in children up to the age of 18. Um, congenital infections are considered acute disease, so treatment is strongly recommended for adults up to 50 years of age with chronic infection who do not already have advanced Chagas cardiomyopathy. So that's the main um, side effect of chronic carriers is the cardiomyopathy. Um, treatment is with benzidazole. It's approved by the FDA for use in children 2 to 12 years of age, but not available in the U.S. Because um, I thought about this, I was like, what if we had somebody treated here, what are we going to give them? Because the next drug is nifir, mox. Um, it's not currently FDA approved. Um, they're both available under our investigation through the CDC. So I would assume if one of our, luckily none of the students and faculty that came back, we tested them, they were not positive for shots. But if that was the case, or if you're out in practice and you, <coughs> you encounter some weird bug or disease, like I said, you can always call the CDC and they can get you where you need to go. Um, so for these, you know, to prevent it if you're living in South America. So a lot of these people lived in huts, you know, without um, roofs um, and brick walls. What's the one that they use? Like, it's not really brick, but it's like almost like mud that they use for their walls. Um, so to prevent it, you can plaster the walls, replace thatched roofs, um, spraying of the houses for these bugs, um, and travelers don't sleep in adobe dwellings or use you can use bed nets. Um, I looked online and I looked at these bugs. They're fairly big, ugly looking bugs. Um, but they have like, this weird body that has 
it's like clear in the center and then on the sides they have almost like a piano type um, appearance on their body. It's like brown, white, brown, white, brown, white. It's all across their body. Um, on the videos, you can never tell how big they actually are, but they looked fairly big, like this big of a bug. I would die if someone was, that was calling on me at night while I was sleeping. Um, <coughs> the, next, the next one we're talking about is African trypanosomiasis. It's also called um, African Sleeping Syndrome. And this is caused by T. brucei. Um, the insect vector is a, a tsetse fly. Um, and humans are usually infected when bitten by the tsetse flies. Uh, they have three stages. It can be cutaneous, hemolymphatic, and CNS. Signs and symptoms. So the cutaneous form, you can have papules that develop at the site of the tsetse fly bite um, within a few days to two weeks. Um, and usually it looks like a dusky, red, painful, indurated nodule. Um, they call it their form of a chancre. And signs and symptoms of chemolymphatic, over several weeks and months, you have intermittent fever, headaches, rigors, um, muscle and joint pain, and you can have transient facial swelling that develops and a generalized uh, lymphadenopathy. And then you can also have what's called venture bottom sign. Um, this is where you have enlarged lymph nodes in the posterior, posterior cervical triangle. <coughs> and with the CNS form, you usually have persistent headaches, um, inability to concentrate, mental changes, personality changes, you can have some daytime somnolence, tremor, ataxia, and then they can develop a terminal coma. Um, Without treatment, some of these patients can die in a coma from undernutrition or from secondary infection. <coughs> Again, how do you diagnose this? You use light microscopy of blood or other fluid samples. So where can you get some of the samples? If you develop a chancre, you can get some fluid from that. Um, if you have a large lymph node, you can aspirate that lymph node, do an F and A, um, and get a sample from that. Uh, bone marrow aspirate or later in the stage you can also do a CSF, which I saw that and then it says a lumbar puncture should be performed in all patients who are di um, diagnosed with this. Um, treatment without CNS involvement you can do pentamidine um, and then with CNS you can do these other drugs. Usually with these I'm not going to probably give you any treatment questions for some of these more odd ones. Um, I want you to kind of know how do you differentiate it from something else. So if I, there's a question if somebody was bitten and they had this sore on their arm um, and they went through or just got back from South America and they have like this diffuse lymphadenopathy and a chancre type sore and the only thing I remember is they were bit by a fly. I would want you to know that it's the African trypanosomiasis. myosis. Okay. Because again, a lot of these you may never ever see, but some of these things I just felt like you need to know, especially the lake water amoeba, amoebas, that's something that you may encounter sometimes if you work, you know, end up working in a rural area where people swim in lakes and things like that a lot. Unless you happen to go to Africa and you practice over in Africa or South America, you might see these more often. Um, prevention is avoid endemic areas. So protection against the flies. You wear substantial wrist and ankle weight uh, length clothing in neutral colors. So what I mean by substantial, substantial is thicker clothing because they can bite through um, really thin clothing. So when you're out, you know, to the wrist, to the ankles, and then also using skin repellents. So it's basically the same type of things you would use or try to do for mosquito bites or anything like that when you're traveling. And then this afternoon, I'll talk about um, tetanus and diphtheria and botulism. Um, those are the diseases of under the bacterial. And then this afternoon, um, Dr. Latassi's back. 
So I hate that I crammed up all of the farm in one day, but um, she had an emergency and she couldn't be here to do the lectures earlier on in the week. Okay? All right. I can go to the church.